to be with you today. Thank you so much for having us. We are grateful to Love Umbrella Network as well for all that you've put together to make this uh, a very lovely, <laughs> a very lovely and successful uh, event already. So yes, um, we will be talking about. On, all right, so you're also hearing I from somewhere. <laughs> so we'll be talking about understanding the sacrifices and sweetness uh, of marriage. And uh, I think the first thing that came to us is um, how do we define sweetness in marriage? Uh, if we're going to understand the sacrifices and sweetness thereof, we need to first know what that sweetness is. If it was of food, obviously someone would say, um sweetness is probably related to sugar something that tastes like sugar is sweet but how do you define sweetness in marriage and um in my field when there is this kind of question you look at international standards and you try to see what the international standard defines as the standard for certain things but in the matters of the art there's no such thing as international standard what we have obviously for us as believers is the Bible. So we can go to the Bible and um, use that as a standard for our definition of what sweetness is in marriage. Obviously not everyone is a Christian and it is at this point that I would say that uh, a relationship with Jesus gives meaning to not just marriages, but also to life because um, you don't have a way to define what is right or wrong without the presence of God in anything that you're doing so god is the one that gives that moral standard and so i would say that the right way or the best way to define sweetness in marriages is, is to look at the originator of marriage the one who uh, started it in the first place and that is uh, god and obviously if you don't have a relationship with him i encourage you to uh, come to him because he wants to come to you and he can help you to build a marriage of your dream even better than what you've imagined. So now that we know how to define sweetness, we also obviously need to know uh, what sacrifice is. And sacrifice is basically just giving up something of value to you that can be really finances, it can be time, it can be relationship. And there are so many things that one can give up to uh, create something that is of value to you and let you go of something else that is also of value. So um, for the part of sacrifice, which I will be talking about mostly, because I think when we had the uh, TESTA event last week, uh, it was agreed that the men should be the one talking sacrifices and the women should talk about sweetness. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that at all. So yes, yeah, so in that case, we'll be talking about uh, spiritual sacrifices, uh, emotional sacrifices, uh, social sacrifices, career sacrifices, and also financial sacrifices. And the reason we're talking about uh, spiritual sacrifices first is because we think that um, only God can truly define a proper marriage. Uh, the society will fail because obviously, uh, as you ask one person, their opinion will vary from, one, the opinion of people will vary really you cannot ask the government or the institutions that be because they don't know either, but obviously God knows. That. And uh, another thing to know is that marriages are, um, should I say, at least. So uh, Jesus, when he was being tempted by the Pharisees, he was asked, um, there was a woman who uh, married someone, the husband died, and then she married another person, another person, up to the seventh person. And Jesus was asked, whose wife would she be in the resurrection? And Jesus responded by saying, you do not know the power of God or of resurrection, implying that resurrection is the power of God. And then he said, in the resurrection, there is no marriage. People do not marry. So in this case, we understand that marriages are for here. So if you're looking forward to being soulmates forever, being in heaven with your husband or wife, and been still doing romance, I'm sorry to disappoint you, it is for this place. But there's something greater, and that is that it reflects something that God has in mind. It is um, a, a kind of um, representation of the union of Christ with his church. So if we are going to represent that union properly, we need to know what's in God's mind 
for every marriage. And in that, there's no way to know God's mind without praying. There's no way to know God's mind without fasting and putting ourselves in a position to hear what God has to say to us. So in terms of sacrifices relating to uh, spiritual life, we would need obviously to, to pray, to fast. We also need to let go of certain things that may come in form of sin or even weight that easily besets us. So these are things, whether you're still preparing for marriage or you're already in marriage, you will need to pray, you will need to fast and do all of these things. If you're already doing them, great. If you're not, uh, it, this is an invitation to say again to you that it is only God that can guarantee a, a proper marriage, a sweet marriage, a good marriage. Um, any other, there's not, if we talk about every other thing, there's no certainty because only God can truly deliver that to any man. And uh, even with all of your efforts to do the right things, if you don't still have God by your side, it's, it's going to be really impossible to really have a sweet marriage in terms of the right definition of sweetness. And I'm also going to quickly talk about emotional sacrifices because um, because we have already linked a sweet marriage to God as the definer of what that is, there are many things that we have then been called to do in terms of our emotions, to be slow to, to, to speak, to be uh, quick to listen, also to be slow to get angry. In fact, the word slow is not do it, uh, do it, uh, don't do it fast. It's don't do it at all, really. Um, um, also, in that same uh, chapter of the Bible, we see that the Bible asks us to put away all wrath. That is, we should not be found in that kind of place. Uh, the reason for that is obviously, if you cannot delay uh, gratification, you cannot delay, you cannot stay out of anger, you need to give the peace of your mind, you're going to struggle because you're going to cause the other person probably to be angry as well. And then you shout at yourself, that is not God's uh, intention for marriages. Um, we, it's not just something that we just do once. It's daily that you, we de delay our gratification. Some things we want to do immediately, but then we find that God is actually asking us to, to wait, or even we, by uh, God's spirit in us can already detect um, that we need to wait, then we, we obviously would have to take that into consideration in the kind of uh, marriage that we're building, which is a sweet marriage. A social sacrifices, sometimes you need to let go of fr some friends. You need to define the kind of friends that will be consistent with the kind of marriage that you're looking forward to having. Not every friendship will work. Um, some friendships we, you have to let go. Also, family members, the kind of influence they have on your marriage will have to be properly defined. It is not every opinion that we count. Obviously, we need counsel. We need people to help us to navigate this life and even marriages. But obviously, uh, not every opinion we count. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, the scripture that says in the multitude of counsels, not of counselors, uh, there's safety. And it is in finding the right counsel and sticking to that as God leads us. Also, um, uh, we, we talk about um, certain kind of uh, maybe circles that you cannot be in again. It's not just friendship alone. It may also be colleagues that you just have to leave that relationship as being colleges and not necessarily having too close affiliation if that is going to be a problem for your marriage. Uh, we also want to talk about career sacrifices. And this is not saying that you let go of your career because of your marriage. But uh, obviously, there are some kind of jobs that you may not be able to take now because you're building a very sweet marriage. And the reason you cannot do it is if there is a kind of career that leaves you no time at all to cater to your marriage. Marriage is a full-time work and you need to devote Sorry, I think we're just muted. Uh, so marriage is a full-time work and there's time to be devoted to that as well. Obviously there is also, um, financial sacrifices maybe as a single person you can decide to spend your money the way you like it in marriages people come together to contribute towards the project also to delay gratification still linked to the emotions want to make sure that the money for instance that you have you can invest for the future of your family the future of your children and also the future of uh, even yourself uh, in terms of your marriage uh, so 
um, I will just leave it here because of time and uh, Shion will talk about sweetness in marriages. Okay, so very briefly, yes, we are quite conscious of the time. Um, I'm just going to highlight the main points as it were in terms of sweetness in marriage. And it's, it's just imperative that when you make all these sacrifices in each of these areas, um, there should be, you know, gain or profit or, you know, the result of these sacrifices in terms of spiritually because we've spoken about spiritual sacrifices that need to be made and um, you then develop an intimate relationship with god which then has an impact on other aspects of your life and um, in terms of the marriage itself um, one of the spiritual gains or sweetness that you can get is that you already have an automatic prayer partner someone to pray with someone to fellowship with um, and the Bible also talks about when you are in agreement with your partner, that your, par that your prayers, I beg your pardon, will not be hindered. And so there is that um, togetherness and coming together as one um, as a benefit to a sweetness in marriage. And in terms of emotionally, you know, we said all things being equal, um, you have a soulmate, you have a partner. Um, and I think in terms of emotionally, one thing that many people are looking forward to um, when, when they get married is to have a legitimate sexual partner and that's something sex is to be enjoyed um, in marriage and um, you also have someone you can talk to um, someone you can talk to when you have good days and enjoy the good days and then there's always there's also someone to rant to as it were if you are having a bad day because you're doing life with that person in terms of social sweetness as it were um, you get new friends so new friends um, from your partner, new, you also have family members. Yes, someone to run to, yes. Um, you also have new family members. So in terms of the social sweetness, I think that your circle in terms of people that you can relate with um, is expanded. And for career, because you, you're living and doing life as it were with someone, you can talk and make decisions about your career. So, um, getting free career advice as it were someone who is not in your workplace or in your school who can see things from an objective point of view and then give you advice and guidance on things to do because sometimes when you are in a particular situation it's difficult to totally and uh, see all the variables at work and um, but when you have someone who's close to you is not in that situation primarily and um, you can get very valuable advice from that person and you also have someone to cheer you on in terms of career development and then the final sacrifice we spoke about was financial sacrifices and as a family you can pull together resources to achieve set goals and because okay so we're making you know an assumption that you have more if both parties are, you know, working, for instance, and um, more to spend on the gospel in advancing God's kingdom, and also if both parties are, are working um, or, you know, have sources of income, there's a safety net if one person or one party begins to have issues such that the other person um, can cover for those. I know we're probably out of time, but we've tried to keep the 15 minutes um, in terms of balancing both the sacrifices and the sweetness of marriage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hmm. Singles, we are about to get the truth into our system. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, yes, we are here, we're here. So now I would like to just, uh, I would like to invite our speaker. I would like to invite our speaker. I hope they are here. Yes, we are. Hey, thank you very much. We have our, our wonderful speakers that are here to enlighten us. I'm so elated to have you both here again joining us. Um, I will go over to, um, to you, but before then, please um, just, uh, follow-up information just um scan the QR code and send your questions that you have because we're going to ask the questions to our our guest speakers here um after they have finished speaking to us so if you have a question please you can send it right now or you can send privately to me just tag me in the chat room and send privately to me 
Thank you. I hand over to you. God bless you. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful job you're doing. And again, hello, everyone. We are glad to be with you. We really feel that this is the room where it is happening. If I was not speaking, I would still want to be in this room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to say to you, everyone, um, to know that you're loved. God loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing or what you have done. So there is yeah. nothing you can do. Yeah, I say yeah. that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing you can do or not do to make God love you more or less. So God already loves you as he wants to. But there are things that we can do to uh, mm. then see better results in terms of the things that pertain to us. Um, so by that, I mean that, um, for instance, despite the fact that God loves you, your marriage would only be um, as good as the uh, effort you put into it. So someone can uh, do all they're supposed to do and still not get a good marriage, and that's where God's grace comes in. But you cannot ignore marriage and expect to get a good marriage. I think we, uh, we've made that much clear. So what we want to do here is to uh, kind of have a build up on what we've sp spoken about in the main room and speak about that as it relates to singles. What can you do now before marriage to actually prepare for marriage in terms of sacrifices and in terms of the expectation of the sweetness? I think that my preferred way of doing this would have been to have it as a conversation mm. to get you to talk and we also talk back in that way. But I agree that that's probably difficult because it's Zoom. So we'll still go into the things that we've spoken about previously, but we'll do it quickly and then we'll just get you to um, talk and just some of the challenges that you probably have seen it doesn't have to be your personal challenges as a single in terms of how do I do this? And I tell you that even though we've been married for five years, we still feel as if this happened yesterday because some of the things that we did then are still the things that we're doing now that we have just carried into the marriage. Obviously, there are boundaries outside marriage, things that we couldn't do, but there are so many other things. You know, people try to say it as if, oh, there are so many things you can do when you're not married, but there's probably just a few things and that's probably just intimacy and obviously you can't live together and uh, maybe there's a limit to how you can bring your resources together in that sense. But when it comes to prayer, when it comes to uh, planning, when it comes to um, even practicing some emotional control, um, social sacrifices, you can still do them before marriage. So we'll be talking about all of these and then we'll just have that kind of rubbing of minds together with you and then we progress from there. So if you're ready, uh, just let me know, maybe if by the way of chat, something, emoji, just send something, let me know that I'm not just speaking to the screen. <laughs> yeah, that's good, yeah, that's good. Thank you, thank you very much. So we, we, we're talking firstly, obviously about spiritual sacrifices. And if you followed us from the main room and also from last week, you would have seen that we are very big on um, actually putting God first. The reason for that is that as humans, we have very, very limited understanding of circumstances of the future. I don't know what's going to happen in the next minute. So only God knows that. And because we don't know, we need to, to commit our lives to someone who sees, who knows the future from the beginning or before the beginning, if you can put it that way, because he doesn't live in time. So he sees the end the same way he sees the beginning. So he's that kind of being, is God. And um, if you don't pray now, you will be a weak part of your marriage If when you marry. If you don't pray at all, also you want to ask, is my partner praying? If they cannot pray, and don't take their word for it, have prayer meetings, obviously not in your room or your bed, have prayer meetings somewhere where obviously you there is accountability. Pray, pray for an extended period of time. Not Father, we thank you for today. Let tomorrow be good. You know, prayer about specific aspects of your life. Uh, you want to pray about that's if you're already in um, a relationship. If you're not, you want to, as a person, pray about your future yourself. Now, 
talk to God about the things that you want to see in your marriage. Obviously, you're not talking as a canal being if you're already saved. Your desires are already tuned to the light of God's word. So you're praying in line with God's wish or will for your life. So you want to pray. If you don't pray, you will bring the same level of weakness into your marriage. And if you get married to someone who doesn't pray without having to say this, in no time you will stop praying as well, most likely because the weakness will rub off you as well. So um, that is very important. Uh, also, those who say that fasting is old fashioned, uh, it's not true. Uh, it's still a way to actually tune ourselves to hearing from God, focusing on him rather than on food or on whatever it is that you're fasting away from. So that's very important. Emotions are probably um, the main thing that we probably can control that can also influence how, how our marriage will progress. So obviously we know that God is the ultimate uh, uh, one who has control over everything, but our emotions, he has given us the power to control our emotions. How you manage your emotions now is the same thing that you, so marriage will not start to teach you patience. It's not true. If you're not patient now, you will not be patient in your marriage. Uh, if you're very, you want to give a piece of your mind now, if you, if you cannot control your your tongue, you can you cannot control your tongue now, there's a very high chance that you still will not be able to do that when you marry. So you want to look at yourself and say, well, what are my weak points? What are the weaknesses that I have? And I say to you for sure, nobody is perfect. And one of the things that we did at the very uh, early stage of our relationship was that we had a monthly, I can't remember if it was a monthly or uh, quarterly, quarterly review of our relationship and we talked about the things that we said we were going to work on how far are we going to be done so I'm going to give you an example when I met her I was a very blunt person blunt before so if someone was doing something and I thought that that thing was annoying or wrong instead of saying ah, can you do it differently I'll say this thing that you're doing is very very wrong and I'll say it that way and well she said to me that you can tell the truth in love you don't have to to you know um, attack people when you speak to them so after some time we just then come together to say all right so these are the things that we said i was going to work on last month um uh, can you uh, kind of give an appraisal can I, can you can you sh tell me how well i've done and then we look okay maybe you've improved a little bit but there's still this that you can do we did that obviously we also planned about uh, obviously children um what we're going to do in terms of our career we we had that kind of um atmosphere for discussing the things that uh, are important to work on so anger obviously also patience uh you don't want someone who um and you don't also want to be someone who is impulsive mm -hmm. you go out to shop ah this necklace is fine even though you have not planned for it emotional outburst that's also emotion you, you cannot wait um, it's not right and all of us we probably have some aspects of emotions that we need to, uh, to optimize for marriage or for God's will in our lives uh, we also want to be able to take criticism when somebody says this is uh, if your spouse for instance or your partner uh, the person you are planning to get married to when they say you're not doing this correctly you don't want to be like, hey, you cannot even take anything everything you complain everything you complain you see, you, you probably end up being someone that no one can tell the truth to. And that is a recipe for disaster. You want to be able to take criticism. Obviously, when you're taking it, you're probably a little bit sad and you you don't feel like you. it's a good time. That's good. That's remorse. And it is also godly to feel bad when, um, when there's something is being said to us that requires us to adjust. But you cannot in guilt you cannot stay in that bad feeling it's just for the moment to think to be sober and then you get over that so but you don't want to be someone that they cannot talk to you say ah we are afraid that if we tell you you will react you don't want to be that person now you you can ask people for feedback obviously the opinion of you is not what's ultimate god's opinion is ultimate but sometimes people, you need to know what people think jesus asked um his disciples what do men say that i am obviously it's not looking for their validation he wanted that we wanted to see if they understood what he is, is doing obviously sometimes you are doing what is right but people don't see it that way and you want to actually ask for feedback 
feedback is one of the ways to uh, improve ourselves to get better in what we're doing and also you want to um, practice all of this before marriage don't wait to marry so i'm just going to leave social and um, career portion to talk about okay so we spoke about um social sacrifices and also sweetness as it were and in terms of single since um, we're preparing for that time i think now is the best time to actually evaluate the friendships or relationships that you have and really it, sometimes you may not take notice or be observant and identify any trends in a particular relationship but i think if, if that's something that hasn't been done before now it's something that should be done now so that if there's someone or if there are people that you know really don't align with either your own plan for yourself or the kind of marriage that you'd want to have, people who probably give bad counsel, um, it's best to start distancing yourself from them now rather than waiting until you get married, just so that your spouse will not be um, the excuse, as it were, and it wouldn't look as though your spouse doesn't want any friends around you. And this goes for both for both genders as it were and so if if they're friends that you already know and i think that as a child of god well big assumption that everyone here is born again but sometimes even if you know you you have um the spirit of god in you and you know when when someone is really not the right friend or giving you the right advice um so i think identifying those friendships before you get married prevents you putting your partner in a difficult situation. Um, I also um, think that it's important to have, you know, boundaries as it were in terms of family and friends giving you direction on what needs to be done. Now we've spoken about counsel and we know that counsel is important, but I'm talking about when it then becomes excessive or when it becomes destructive and saying, no, you shouldn't be doing this or yes, you should do this. You need to, for yourself, be assertive, both male and female, about what you want in your marriage and um, there should be a limit or a boundary to what people, friends or family can tell you to do, because that's one of the major issues um, that can come up in marriage, external influences from family, from friends, from colleagues, um, anyone that's external to the marriage um, can have an influence and you, you need to develop that before you get married because when you're in a relationship people will say all sorts um, but it's important to already start practicing that um, as Felix has said so that's the social bit. In terms of the career bit and I think we mentioned a little bit about this last week about knowing exactly what you want to do and have you already started doing that in your career? Um, and if, for instance, you are in a job or a career path that doesn't give you any time for even yourself, so if, for instance, you work nine to five, and even when you get back home from work, you, you know, if there's traffic, you get home at a particular time, and even when you get back home, you still have to continue working. And um, is, is the job the kind of job where your boss can call you on a weekend or a Saturday or a Sunday and say you need to do this or you need to come into the office? I think that, you know, understanding the career that you are in is very important so that if there are changes that need to be made, you make those changes before you get married. Marriage takes a lot of effort. It takes effort from both parties. And it also needs time to build. So you need time for your family. You need time for your husband. This is not even talking about children because not everyone, you know, you, you even in the immediate, you may not have children or, you know, but even if it's just the husband and the wife, there's a lot of time that's required. If you then have children, even more time um, will be required to, um, to be devoted um, to your family. Um, I think th those are the major things. And just having that work-life balance, especially when talking about career um, and having a balance between work and then you know, having time for your family. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and finally, I'm just going to talk also about uh, career and maybe make it another point on social. Even though uh, Sean talked about it, I just want to kind of emphasize it a little bit. And that's the... Part of third parties, and I'm going to just use an example. When we 
were uh, caught in just preparing for marriage. I had a roommate who once told uh, Sean to serve us, you know, uh, just like instruct your partner to go, hey, go and get us food. And you, for instance, a man, you want to put your uh, feet on, foot on the ground and say, no, that's not going to happen. If you want to eat, go take your food. You don't want to have people around you who disrespect the person you're with. And you don't want to wait to marriage to correct that. If you see anything like that, you want to you, you want to correct it immediately. And even if you are a woman and uh, you have friends who just Mock say yeah or just... say like uh, it's not even good enough, what is even doing with side? Those kind of comments, you want to nip them in the bud because you cannot allow it for four, two, three years of uh, courtship and then in marriage now say you have to stop now. Be like, what's the difference? So you want to start. Uh, early and in terms of financial uh, sacrifices and things that one can do before marriage if you are earning money you want to be able to budget that money you don't want to be the type of person who will say i finished the money before i was paid or finished spending before i was paid that's going to become a problem in marriage because obviously now you're planning for not just you but for a family you need to make plans for not just that day but the future to invest to, to plan for projects. Sometimes you need to plan to pay rent. Maybe now you stay with uh, friends or family, you don't pay as much. And even if you have a husband who pays all the bills, just remember that life is in cycles. Sometimes people um, lose their jobs and- A wife who pays all the bills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, even if it's the wife who pays all the bills and the man is just uh, um, maybe full, uh, just, taking care of the kids or something like that. Remember that it's possible that things will change and the person who pays will not be able to pay anymore. But we even encourage, obviously, for uh, Mm -hmm. the parties to have certain contribution in terms of finances that they bring to that marriage because it just uh, maintains that value that the other person has as well. And also, uh, you you then um, kind of... um, you make whatever you have to feel like it's more. And there are some cases where you may not be able to do that. Let's say you've got three kids and uh, paying for their uh, for the care would mean that you're using all the money that, or even more than the money that one person earns, and that person then decides to stay with the children. That's obviously valid. But if nothing like that is stopping you, it's good to actually bring all the resources you can get to marriage because then it's, exactly what the Bible is saying when it says um, two are better than one. And also, um, this is not just about you, also about your partner. You don't want a partner who doesn't have regard for money. You Mm -hmm. see, Um, one of the uh, things we learn from the Bible is the parable of uh, of talent. You know, Um, when the master gave the people talent, gave them different uh, kind, different amounts of talent, really. And you see, uh, there were people who invested that talent, but someone just buried it. And um, it was called wicked. That's the, one of the description that the master gave of him. He even said you could have invested it with bank, with the bank. So that's one of the <laughs> biblical basis for investment that uh, you, you, you cannot just be there bearing what God has given to you all in the name of marriage. Marriage should not destroy you. It should actually build you and help you to build yourself and also build your partner. So marriage is constructive. Remember that we are modeling uh, Jesus Christ and his relationship with his church in marriage and Jesus builds us up. And that is the same thing you should do with with your partner and for your partner. It doesn't matter the gender. So uh, that's where we'll just put an end to what we've got to say. And we are definitely open to questions. Thank you. you so much speakers thank you thank you thank you wow if you have been so if you have been so blessed by this can you just type something in the chat box someone said the workshop is full of wisdom yes it's full of wisdom one of the profound word i i heard was marriage is constructive marriage is constructive and so we both have to work together um, to make this. Oh my God. And have to share with me.
I have some questions here with me. All right. Uh, so um, I think these questions are uh, coming from all that we have learned today. So it might not specifically relate to um, what has just been spoken about right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, the first question I have is, is it normal for me to have sexual thoughts as a, as a single lady? Is it normal for me to have sexual thoughts as a single lady? Wow, these this questions, please keep your questions coming. We'll take as many as possible. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. And um, it's very important to ask that question because obviously sometimes people think that something is wrong with them. Um, every human being that is, okay, maybe that's a generalization, but most people have sexual thoughts, whether they are married or not. In fact, some married people have sexual thoughts towards people who, are, who they, are, they are not married to. So the thought in itself is not the issue. It is what you then do after the thoughts. Um, when you have the thoughts, you also need to remember that you have God's help to overcome whatever that's what is what temptation is mm -hmm. so um when in uh, the bible in uh, luke chapter 4 when the devil obviously took jesus to be tempted those words that uh, he spoke to jesus those are thoughts obviously the devil did not appear in one black whatever and was sometimes it's even what people say in adverts you just see a suggestion something suggestive and then it strikes some things in your eye and you start to think about things that you should not think about. But then um, what I do is that I then remind myself of who I am in Christ Jesus and what he has done for me. And I'm saying this to you that whether it was before marriage or now that I'm married, thoughts do come. When you see people, you can even start to imagine things. And when those things come, you don't want to dwell on them. You don't. Uh, I, I read something this morning by uh, Billy Akani who said that once that thought comes, you don't want to think about it again. Mm -hmm. If you look at some, if you see someone that provokes you sexually, you don't want to look again. Um, you know that's what uh, Job said that he has made a covenant with his eyes not to look onto anyone uh, um, lost after anyone by looking at them. So you want to. Uh, there's a need for control. That's what the Bible says that the fruit of our spirit is, which is self-control. So as the fruit of your spirit, you need to, I remind myself that my spirit, I, in my spirit, I've got self-control. So I'm able to control my thoughts. So when they come, you want to say, bring that thought into subjection to, to Christ. So uh, obviously Christ is superior. And we are, so one of the things we have as believers, and if you're not, I'm again inviting you to have a relationship with Jesus, is that he, he aids us against the enemy. So Jesus helps us to overcome those thoughts. So the thought in itself is not a problem. It's what happens after the thought, or if you dwell on it. There's a way you can dwell on a thought and you, it becomes like a fantasy and you don't want to leave that thought. That is already becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. But when it comes, uh, you need to immediately get out of it by God's help. And I'm praying for the person who has asked that uh, you will continually receive God's help and you will not uh, fall into temptation in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Wow, thank you so much for that um, profound answer. Um, I hope whoever asked this question, you were, your questions were, were answered or your question was answered. Um, the next question we have is, how do I overcome lust as a single? Like, I think this is a follow-up question. So um, how do I overcome lust as a single? Mm -hmm. This is... Uh, it, it's a very valid and very genuine question. And it's also very linked to the, the first question. And I'm not just going to give you some uh, theoretical answers. I'm going to talk to you about myself and my experiences as a, a single person. So... Um, before I met my wife, I was in a relationship as well with someone who had the name. So I, one of my friends shares the joke that I heard right, I just did not see correctly. And one of the things that happened consistently in that relationship was that um, there were thoughts of loss and, you know, um, things that I ought not to be doing. And I did all sorts of things. I prayed, I fasted. And there was even a time I went on like marathon fast. I don't want to have sexual thoughts anymore and obviously I think God is merciful I actually know it um 
he just looks at me and he, he obviously guides me every time I make those kind of decisions. But I think that it's probably not prayers and fasting that will help you. I think it is renewing the mind, which is God's word. And that takes time. So it's not like you just, it's not, um, uh, it's not like yeah. you take the Bible and you just flip it and say, God speak to me, God speak to me. It's actually getting to know who you are in Christ and then knowing that you've got dominion over sexual lust, uh, whatever lust and sexual um, kind of thoughts that don't align with God's will. And once you get to that place where you've got a, a an understanding of who you are and a good relationship with, him, with Jesus, it's easier then to just lean on him, let him do the work for you. He's not asking you to do the heavy lifting, he's just saying to lay it at his feet. So if you continually see yourself as the person who needs to do the work, you will fall short because you're not that strong. Um, it is true Christ that we have our strength. So um, I would just say to you that it is by knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and that doesn't come uh, without studying. Yeah, so. Thank you, thank you. Wow, renewing your mind, renewing your mind. God help us to renew our mind because like, a lot of, lot of, uh, it's very easy for 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 the flesh to be more um, ruling over our 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 day to day life and activities with what we see. But renewing our minds in Christ will help us, you know, scale through. Thank you so much for that answer. The next question we have is, I am in a relationship and have gone far sexually with my partner. How do I come out? Which resources can you suggest, like books? Etc. Okay, so I think that this was something that Felix mentioned earlier, and um, that you are loved, and there's nothing, there's nothing that you have done or will do that will make you less loved by God, and that's one thing we wanted to retreat at the beginning. The fact that just like this person has said, um, they've gone far sexually with a particular person, and. Um, it's not something that you should be condemned about. Of course, there should be the repentance um, and trusting God, repenting, stopping, maybe leaving, leaving um, or giving yourself a bit of distance from that person. I'm still going to reverse to Felix, Felix to give examples of resources. But I think the first thing that I want to emphasize is that understanding and acknowledging to yourself that you've done this and this is wrong is actually a very big and massive step. So it's almost like a very big burden for that. The next thing I would say is to repent. Um, and that repentance, I think, um, should involve a bit of separation or distance um, from that person. And I'll just let Felix talk about maybe some resources. Yes, yes. Uh, also, before I talk about resources, I want to say that sin tries where there is secrecy, where there's no accountability. Um, I'm not sure when the person says get out, I'm wondering if it is from that situation or from mm -hmm. that relationship. And if it is from the situation, I won't say that it's really hard to um, stop having sex, for instance, with someone that you've been doing that with, what has changed, that's what the person will wonder. So sometimes, and as hard as it is, you may need to leave that relationship, unfortunately, and um, or just put your just have to say that this is not going to happen again and if you are going to continue in that relationship you need someone to report to you need someone who knows what has happened maybe your pastor and then let them um, again this is very risky but mm. i'm hoping that you have a good church and that you have someone that god has indeed directed you to as a as a leader as uh, an overseer over your life uh, that can guide you appropriately but you need to be open you need someone who can say to you what have you done and you will not have to lie to the person but if there's no such um person, a person yeah. for you I i'm encouraging you to leave that relationship and uh, just start on a new state and i know that uh in the main room they said uh, they talked about secondary or second degree virginity and all of that but you see um with christ Everyone who is in name is new, whether you are a virgin or not. Um, God loves you and you can still have a beautiful life. And you, a can, beautiful marriage. you can have a beautiful marriage. And um, yes, so I would just want to say to you that if you don't have anyone to report to, 
um, and there's nobody that can hold you accountable. Maybe you want to step out of that relationship mm -hmm. and have that kind of relationship with someone who can even be the same gender as you if you're not, if you cannot trust the opposite sex that much and then start to report to them, give them updates about your progress with, uh, with your work, in your work with God. And then definitely you can now build upon that. Remember, we also said that if you don't have a um, an opinion of where you are going in life, it's hard to actually have a good marriage. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. And resources wise, the Bible is the main resource that you need. <laughs> you there are many yeah. books that say, but I think that knowing who you are in Christ is the yeah, primary exactly. thing, and every other thing can just whatever guide is there to how not to have sex or how not to. They are just subjective, but the Bible actually more than just guides also empowers us because the spirit of the Lord is actually the author of what you have in the Bible. So it's not just the written word alone. There's also that breath that comes upon us when we study. So I'm just going to recommend the Bible for, to you here. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Wow, that's really, that's really powerful. Thank you, thank you. So the next um, question we have is, is it okay for me to learn about sex now as I get ready for marriage? Or is it too early? I'm a lady in my early 20s. Hmm. Um, it, it's a very difficult question to answer. And the reason for that is um, motives count. So I could say a no, and your motive, because obviously if you are in class, in a biology class, they probably teach reproduction and you're learning about sex, but it depends. What are you learning? Um, are you just learning what it entails, obviously to know what to expect in marriage, um, or you're learning all of the things that will then evoke that kind of thought that many people are trying to run away from. So um, there's no wisdom also in getting to marriage unprepared. So you want to speak about things, even with your partner, about um, um, expectations. And if you have been someone who expects you to hang in mid-air and then you, you have sex that way, that's probably too big for many people and they'll say they can't do that. So those conversations probably helpful. So when we were going through counseling, we were uh, taught about sex and um, different things relating to it. So when you're preparing for marriage, even the church teaches that, so there's no problem with that. But if your learning involves practicing before marriage, I think that that's too far. Um, so I think it depends on what, you're, what learning. you're learning. So yes, if you're just learning what it entails, um, you may even be learning more about your own body. Um, yes, so for instance, um, for I think I'll let you speak about that. Yeah. Yes, I just remembered a book um, that, that I found quite often. I think you, you were the one that gave me the book. The book is titled Every Woman. Now, I don't know what gender is asking this question. Apologies if it was a guy asking this question, but this might be useful to the ladies here. Um, so there's, there's a book, I'd, I'll have to check for the author of the book, but the book is titled Every Woman. And just to reiterate what Felix has said, so if it is um, learning about what to expect, um, yes, I think that that would be fine. But at, if, if it then becomes creating thoughts that are lustful, you know, thoughts that, you know, just as we said, we've answered two questions about people, um, from people who want to stop having those kind of thoughts. I think there needs to be a boundary um, between what is being learned as a single. And you also want to remember that if you're married to the right person, you have a lifetime to learn about sex. So yes. there's, no, there's no rush. <laughs> Obviously, you can know some things. And it's also good to be open with the person you're with if you're already in a relationship. You want to know how far they have gone in terms of their learning, maybe they have even practiced and you haven't, and then it looks like there's a disparity. And if you're the kind of person who has gone far, you want to also try as much as possible to be patient with your partner, understanding that they haven't had that kind of experience and just helping, um, maybe not, maybe even just being, being kind and not expecting unrealistic things from the person you're married to. And I think the last, uh, the speaker in the main session talked about pornography. 
and that can fill your head with ideas of things that are scripted, not real, and uh, you just expect that in your marriage, um, you are not going to find that most of the time. Yeah. yeah. You remember they are caught, then they're done again, whatever way they do them. They are like acting movies. So yes. don't, yes. don't, don't, don't yeah. expect that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so very much for that wonderful answer. Um, so um, I have a question from the chat room, and the person is asking after being together for five and a half years, Man is rejecting to move in together, get married. Excuse his financial part, although the finances are enough for basic stuff. He said he needs about one, one and a half more years. So the person is asking, is it normal or not? If not, how can the person deal with it? Okay, um, so it, it's also another difficult question because we don't know how that relationship is. So if this is a relationship that is good and you have built it uh, deliberately towards marriage, you have put in a lot of effort. The person is also doing the same. You have most of the things ready, just the finances. And he thinks or she thinks that there's a need for a little bit more. I think that if this is the right person, one and a half years, it's not, long, it's, it's not too long to wait for the right person. But if this is someone who is running away from responsibilities mm -hmm. or who doesn't really want to marry you and is just wasting Falling. your time, you want to, um, again, um, this kind of counsel in just one of thing is good, but it's not sufficient. Sometimes mm -hmm. you need um, someone who actually knows mm -hmm. you and knows the person to hold both of you accountable and say, brother, sister, what are you doing? So you need that local counsel. You need someone who is there in your church or in your uh, environment, not just uh, uh, area brother or something, but someone who knows the Lord and who can guide you del deliberately. So I'm not going to encourage you to leave your relationship because of one and a half years of waiting. I, I, I want you to actually look for um, a local counsel and mm -hmm. also encourage your partner to seek that. If the person is saying one and a half years, then you can start planning. You can start, um, yeah. you can start going for counseling. You can even... Um, ask the person, okay, if you're making this commitment, are you ready to meet my family? Introduction and all of that. Yeah, for us, we um, had we, an introduction. Yeah, so I was going to leave Nigeria for my master's and she was leaving also to a different country. And a way for us, for instance, at the time to show our commitment to ourselves was to actually have our introduction, bring our parents together, which we thought was a significant thing. And even though from the time of introduction to marriage for us was probably over a year, yeah. definitely over a year, it still meant that we knew that there was something we needed to do. We just needed to be in a better position to do it. So those questions need, need to be asked. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so um, for some of us who's, who have asked some questions and it has not been answered, you can still scan the QR code later on and the answer will be sent to you on your email. Okay. So um, because we don't have so much time, that's why. I have, um, if there is still more time, we'll take maybe one or two more questions. Someone sent a question now in the, in the group chat, but before that, I would, okay, let me ask this one. <laughs> After a breakup, is there a specific timeline one needs for healing to move into another meaningful relationship? Mm. Many, many, many things to consider. Uh, how long was the relationship that you've broken up? Uh, from or you know whatever um so if you've just dated someone for two days and there's a breakup obviously you're probably ready there's no significant emotional damage but if you have spent four years in a relationship um uh, there's and only you and obviously god can know when you're ready to move on what you don't want is using relationships as rebound you know um just to get back maybe at the person you've broken up from. See, see my life is good. Most times it is not. It's just pretense. Um, you, you also don't want to inflict the pain that you're carrying on the next person you, you're, you're with. Um, so you, you, only you can tell if you've truly moved on. So I'll just leave it there because of time. Yeah, the breakout room is closing in less than a minute. Yeah.
hello everyone again. Um, I think we, we had a very good time in a in a single single session where we were just building up on things that we needed to do. And I think I'll just do a recap, as it were, of the major areas that we highlighted. And of course, these are not exhaustive. So we spoke about spiritual development and um, the sacrifices that are involved in that and also the sweetness involved in that. We spoke about career development and sacrifices. Um, we spoke about social development and sacrifices. We spoke about emotional development and sacrifices um, and also the financial bit. And I think that for a single person or someone who isn't married yet, these are just some areas, some major things to think about. Um, of course, you know, as you, you need to prepare as much as possible, but I think another thing to mention is to have an open mind and just be willing to learn as you go on in the journey of marriage when you eventually get married, um, because there'll be, a lot, there'll be new things to learn um, and you'd also be adapting to the person that you're with. And so as much as, you know, you've done a lot of preparation, a lot of planning, a lot of discussions, um, there will be a need to trust God and go through the process together. Um, I think that's a very... Yeah, yeah. and also summary. a summary of, uh, of the questions we had. Yeah. So many of the questions revolved around sexual purity and, um, you know, how to get out of difficult situations and also how to... Um, build something meaningful from there. And just like we said to our people in the group, and we still want to say to everyone that God loves you, and no matter who you are, what you've done, there's nothing you can do or not do to make God love you more or less. And you need to know that. And that should then be a catalyst for you to then love him and do what he is calling you to do, to live a pure life, a life of uh, devotion to him. And obviously that will also have an impact, positive one, on your marriage when you marry, if you're not, or if you're already married. And if you're carrying any guilt, it is time to drop it. God is not the author of that. And God is helping you to build something meaningful from this point with him through his spirit. And we concluded that it is true God's word that we can get to know God and to know ourselves and what he has called us to be. And that is the only way to actually be free from the pressure and from the weight of sin.